always kind of influenced by wanting to be the anti-Martha Stewart in that I always hated that lifestyle magazines didn't celebrate their writers as individuals and it was kind of this team voice and for me that didn't work. I wanted to know who were the stylists, who made those paper flowers, like who took the photographs, who made the food. I wanted to know everything. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Devers. I'm Jamie Derringer and this is Clever. And today we're talking to publisher and digital media entrepreneur Grace Bonney. You've heard of Design Sponge. That's her blog. She started it in 2004 and it's gained enormous popularity. But it's remarkable not only for its wide readership, but also for its longevity and the way Grace has evolved Design Sponge to reflect her own evolving values. She's published two books, Design Sponge at Home and In the Company of Women, the latter being a compilation of inspiration and advice from female makers and entrepreneurs, and a New York Times bestseller. And she recently started Good Company, a print magazine and a podcast about the intersection of creativity and business. She's a powerhouse for sure. Let's talk to Grace. I'm Grace Bonney. Um, I don't have a headquarters. <laughs> I guess if I did, it would be here uh, in my house in the Hudson Valley in New York, where I live with my wife and my three pets. And I work on a few projects. I uh, run a blog called Design Sponge. I also run a print magazine and a podcast called Good Company. And I'm working on another book. So I like to write particularly about people who work in some sort of creative field. And these days, I'm most interested in kind of understanding what makes people do the things they do and how that turns into the beautiful things that all of us like to write about. And why? Why do you do that? (laughs) That's a good question. I wish I knew like a clearer answer to why I do it. It's what makes me happy. I mean, to be brutally honest, I was an art major in college, and I was a terrible one. And at my senior critique, one of the art teachers pulled me aside and said, you have no business being in (gasps) art. You are not good. (laughs) And I remember a professor pulled me outside, a different professor, and said, don't listen to him. You are a creative person, but I agree, like, fine art is not going to be your calling, but you have a place in this community. And don't forget that lots of people work in art and design who aren't designers. And that really stayed with me. And I think I've always been driven by being around creative people and understanding that I don't have to be somebody making a painting or making a sculpture to be here and have a voice. And so I don't know, I I guess I just really enjoy and find myself really fueled by people who make things. Here, here. I think Jamie and I would high five you, cheers you, toast you, (laughs) all of that. We're the same thing. And I think the whole creative community needs an ecosystem. And if we were all just making stuff, then who would be talking about it? And Mm -hmm. who would be helping us spread the word? Yeah, I wouldn't even be here without Grace. So I have to be (laughs) completely honest that like if Design Sponge didn't exist, Design Milk probably wouldn't exist either. So yay. (laughs) I'm glad we all exist. (laughs) All right. So let's go back to the beginning. Let's talk about what was your family like? Uh, Where did you grow up? What were you into as a child? Talk to us about your childhood. It's so funny. I have been reliving my childhood in this very big way right now because the 90s are like having this beautiful resurgence right now. And it's been reminding me like what part of my childhood did I enjoy? And for the most part, I remember not enjoying growing up. Um, I'm from Virginia and I'm from a beach town, Virginia Beach. And it's very surfer, very skater, and everybody's blonde and tan. And I just did not fit in in that community at all. And so the things that I really enjoyed were like riot girl music and like punk rock culture. And I in no way was representative of either of those communities, but I liked how angry they were. And I think as a kid, I didn't have an outlet for how frustrated I was by like not fitting into that scene. So I really dove a lot into art and music and I played electric guitar and thought one day I'd be in like a cool girl band and that never happened. But the things that I really loved when I was a kid are the things that still really drive me now. And I I find a lot of inspiration and motivation in like pretty angry music and kind of reactionary artwork. And those things are still really important to me now. And what was your relationship like with your parents? Like, were you also rebelling against them with that angry music and reactionary artwork? Or were they also kind of rebels and you were taking a chip off the old block or what? (laughs) No, (laughs) 
<laughs> so I'm an only child. I had a very close relationship with both of my parents, but I think the three of us were the least rebellious human beings on earth at that point. Both of my parents, I guess in a way, rebelled. They both came from very religious families that were involved in the church. And one of my grandfathers was a minister and the other two were highly involved in all things church. And neither of my parents continued with that into our life as a family. So I think they did rebel in their own way. Mm -hmm. Um, But we were pretty basic. And I think that extended to everything we did. But I definitely tried to rebel in my own way. I think I, I mean, I knew at a pretty early age that I was not straight. And that was something that did not go over well with my family at the time. So I think my biggest rebellion was one that kind of carried out over many decades of kind of understanding that that was a part of my identity and having that not go over so well in the South in general. It's just not a thing most people were into at that point in the 90s. And that was always my biggest rebellion outside of my like sexual identity. That was everything else my parents fully embraced. Like they have always taught me to believe in myself. They've never questioned like any of my professional interests or any of like, I mean, they let me be an art major. Yeah. That's, you know, most parents don't say like, yes, run towards, you know, printmaking. That's a great idea. <laughs> so, and I remember like I, I failed, like I really like, you know, big fat F failed my first course in college and like cried home calling thinking they were going to yell at me. And my mom was so supportive and was like, you know, did you learn something? Like, you know, you're still alive. Failing something isn't the end of the world. I think this was an important moment for you. Like, stop trying to be such a perfectionist. And so, you know, they've always been really supportive. And so I think my only rebellion really had to do more with my my personal identity than anything else. You mentioned that you knew from a young age that you weren't straight. What did that really mean for you in terms of the internal struggle and the recognition by your parents that you weren't straight? And how did that play out for you in your adolescence? And was that kind of a raw time? Were you still reconciling with it yourself? What did that look like? In fewer ways than I did when I was younger, I'm still reconciling with it. And I think that I definitely didn't know, I didn't understand anything that was happening to me at that age. And I, like a lot of people, like fell in love with my best friend and didn't quite understand what that was. But everybody around me understood what that was. And rather than sitting me down and having a conversation, you know, kids pass notes and people say things. And it was really traumatic. And I've since kind of reunited with a lot of people from high school who I also didn't know were, you know, somewhere on the LGBT spectrum and kind of had the same experience of kind of being outed in one way or another at our high school and and even in middle school and just feeling like nobody was there to explain it to us because it just wasn't socially acceptable at that time. Like, it blows my mind now that kids have like gay straight alliances in their schools and that they like come out when they're like 12 and that just did not happen in my school in the 90s. So it took me a long time to kind of reckon with that and to try to figure out what I wanted my life to look like rather than what I thought my parents wanted my life to look like, which, you know, took me until I was like 30. (laughs) So just a little bit of time. Um, I feel like I still struggle with that sometimes, though, like what society expects from you versus what you actually want and how those things either align or are completely counter to each other. Yeah. And it's messy. It's messy as hell. I mean, and it's especially difficult. And I mean, you all will understand this as like when you live in a world where your work is online, your life is online, and the internet would like you to be a very neat non-complicated package, you internalize, at least I internalized that and was like, this will be very messy for people to understand. And what will that mean? And I had to kind of go through that, you know, public coming out and the ending of a marriage and just all of that to live through that publicly was, was really bumpy. But Mm -hmm. I think that was really important for me as to just let all of the like striving for some sort of clean, perfect perception to just let it go because it doesn't exist. And whenever I see that someone has that, I always kind of ask the question in my head of like, are things as perfect as they seem? Because I think most of us are, you know, real people with complicated lives. Most of us. Yeah. (laughs) We're mostly real people (laughs) with complicated lives. No, I I think that that, you know, letting go of perfection is something that we definitely want to talk about throughout this whole interview, because it's a really important thing. And if you're getting mixed messages from both your peer group and your parents about you know, something's so intrinsic to your who you are, your identity is your sexuality, then I'm sure it causes confusion. I mean, you talked about angry music and reactionary artwork. 
how did your spirit and your sense of social justice and your creativity start to manifest in your youth and adolescence? I think my creativity had a place in my life pretty early on. I think like a lot of kids in the 90s discovered collage and kind of (laughs) angry collaging in particular uh, with a lot of like Rolling Stone and Sassy magazines, which was my, you know, privileged middle America version of rebellion. And that I think taught me that I had a voice and I had a point of view in a way that I didn't quite recognize at that age. But looking back, like that was when I was making publications, like I would write pretend newspapers. And I would collage together all sorts of things and people that I thought were cool and interesting ideas and beautiful images. And I got into fashion. And I think I was the most creatively open then. And I'm really trying to get back into that headspace now of enjoying things Mm. for the sake of enjoying them and not for the sake of how does this turn into content? Because that's Oh my God. (laughs) You're (laughs) so preaching to the choir right now. You know, I got an email the other day from someone who was like, hi, I'm an aspiring content creator. And I just wanted to like (laughs) throw my laptop across the room. I mean, I think for a certain generation, that's, that's totally fine and acceptable because that's the world they're growing up in. But I really miss just enjoying things and making things for the fun of it. And that's how Design Sponge started. There was never a big goal to do anything with it. And so I guess in a way, Design Sponge has been my biggest creative project ever, which I'm so grateful for. But in terms of social justice, I mean, good God, that's a very recent thing for me. I have very much been a very clueless white girl for a long time. And it wasn't until probably maybe five or six years ago, um, when I started hearing from readers and I mean, my own team members being like, we really need to pay attention to the bigger issues that we're ignoring. We need to have a more inclusive team. We need to have more inclusive content. And I fell back on the very embarrassing defense that a lot of people use, which is like, well, we're just focusing on design and I'm just focusing on talent. And, you know, I was fully a part of a system that suppresses the voices of people of color and disabled people and queer people. And I just really was like soaking and all that in a really ugly way. And thankfully, a lot of people kind of sat me down one on one and were like, you have a responsibility to be better than this. And I think that was kind of a wake up call for me. And that was probably maybe five or six years ago when I had started my radio show and people were pointing out that the vast majority of my guests were white women who looked and sounded like me. And they were right. It's been a a sort of slow and embarrassingly slow process for me. But I'm glad that it's happened and that it's going to be happening for the rest of my life because my work, I think, has been better because of that. And I think that as a human being, I just am realizing how much I've missed out on just because of my own ignorance. So I'm just happy to be in a place of learning and listening and trying to do less talking. Well, I I appreciate you sharing that with us because I think we're all kind of in the same boat of, of trying to recognize how we can be better and not just trying to be the well-meaning white ladies And, you know, and to really put actions behind that sentiment and not just words. And to hear you express, I mean, a very core idea, which is ignorance means you're missing out on a lot of really cool stuff, really amazing points of view, really educational perspectives. It's just life is so much richer when you make a concerted effort to not be ignorant and be really inclusive. So... Thank you for being so transparent about that. But let's continue on with the Grace story because we do have to talk. You do have to talk during this <laughs> podcast. Well, let's talk about Grace, the college years. <laughs> so you oh, went God. to the, co- the College of William and Mary. So what did you study and what were the college years like for you? Well, I had, I think, two very different college experiences. So I went to NYU in New York City for a year and a half. Was that, that for was art? Started. No, for journalism. Um, I always wanted to write for a newspaper. I thought I was going to be like a political journalist. My dream was to go to um, Georgetown, but I didn't get in. And so I applied to NYU kind of half as a joke and the other half because of Felicity. And (laughs) then I I got in and my parents were like, well, we're never sending you there because we can't afford that. And they're right. And then I applied for a ton of scholarships and I looked out and got them. And then they basically had no excuse for me not to go because I kind of cobbled together a full ride out of it. And they couldn't really (laughs) stop me. So I went there, fell in love with the city from the second my feet hit the ground, but loathed the school experience there and just was not the school for me. And so 
I said a very difficult goodbye to New York and I went back to William and Mary, which was a place where I learned to take the giant chip off of my shoulder that New York City very commonly puts on to, to NYU freshmen. And I learned to embrace what it was to be back in Virginia and to learn at a really, really great school. But it was there that I realized I really wanted to be around art more and I always loved it. It was also where I started a radio show and I had a radio show every Friday night just called Jam Band Radio. And I played tons of fish just basically <laughs> over and over and over again. And I would make my own hemp belts. And it was a very interesting time in my life. <laughs> I was learning a lot about art, which was great. I had an incredible professor who kind of took me under her wing and I think understood that I didn't fit in there. I think she also very much knew that I was gay and didn't quite <laughs> like know how to help me. But she would give me like incredible books about like Ray Eames and women who were product designers and like graphic designers and was like, I think that this is kind of your community. And that was my first exposure to the world of design and to in particular women in design. And it was a really formative time. I just didn't realize it. I was just kind of like, I like all these disparate things. What the hell am I going to do with them all? And so the second I graduated, I moved back to New York literally the day after graduation and took a job at a record label and thought I'd go into music. And that didn't really happen. So I kind of wedged my way back into design. But looking backwards, college with that combination of a few years of journalism and then really crammed few years of an art major kind of melded their way into the job that I would end up having. I just didn't know that was happening at the time. When you stopped working at the record label, were you doing like freelance or like design writing at that time? I know you started Design Sponge pretty much around that time as well. No, I wish I had been. I was working for a teeny tiny PR firm oh. that represented like some really big mid-century houses like Vitra and Knoll and people like that. And it was just essentially me and the woman who ran the firm. And that was my kind of entree into the world of, I guess, contract design and getting to meet people who were like market editors and understanding what people actually do at magazines. And uh, that was at the time I thought I wanted to be a market editor and just write about products and see new things. And that was very much where I was in life was like, I wanted to talk about stuff just all the time. Like, look at this rug, look at this pillow, look at this fabric. And so I wasn't finding a place to do that at that job, obviously, because my job was to write press releases. But I didn't really know where else I was going to do that without a degree in journalism or any sort of magazine experience. So I started the blog as a way to just talk about those things in my own home. And I think it just was, you know, right place, right time, right content and Design Sponge, which was a thousand percent like my lunch hobby from my boss ended up becoming the thing that like got me a job at a magazine that I just never, ever could have predicted. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to us a little bit about the evolution of Design Sponge? How has it grown throughout the years? It's funny. So Design Sponge will be 15 next year. And that's kind of the age it feels like. Like I feel like Design Sponge is this like kid that's pretty close to like getting ready to go to college and like, <laughs> start something different. And I mean, it started as me. And just talking about stuff. And I wrote everything in lowercase and inside of brackets because I thought that was so clever and so interesting. And in its early days, I would like call out other journalists that I thought were copying me. I just really had everything wrong. And I think I was really influenced by the political blog Wonkette. And I, I loved like all things politics. And she was really snarky and she called people out all the time. So I thought that was what I was supposed to do. And I really quickly learned that I could not handle the blowback that came from that. <laughs> So I really quickly kind of changed into just talking about things I thought were nice and happy. And as it grew, I was always kind of influenced by wanting to be the anti Martha Stewart in that I always hated that lifestyle magazines didn't celebrate their writers as individuals. And it was kind of this team voice. And for me, that didn't work. I wanted to know who were the stylists, who made those paper flowers, like, who took the photographs? Who made That's, the food? I wanted to I've know everything. I've always been so, so like wanted, annoyed with how I don't know. I I love seeing the granular in a process. So I've always wanted to be able to discern the distinct voices that make up the whole. And so I've always been really discomforted by that idea of the company voice that you're talking about. I'm so glad to hear you say that. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. I understand from a business perspective why it's probably better to have a team voice. But I think for me at that time, like at the birth of blog, like or at least design blogs, like it felt more important to be 
true to what the team was, which was a whole bunch of young people trying to figure things out and not making any money. And so, you know, I brought on my first few editors, I think three years into Design Sponge. And that's when we became an actual team. And instead of me just writing about stuff I was seeing in Brooklyn, we were writing about DIY and writing about food and, you know, writing about like flowers and all sorts of stuff. And those early team members have gone on to be like incredibly important people in our community. And like Sarah Rayannon from Saipua, the florist, like was our very first flower columnist. And this was before she even had a shop, I think. And Derek and Lauren, who would go on to run the Curiosity Shop in San Francisco, were our first DIY editors. And it was just a really exciting time to be online because I couldn't believe that anybody would pay us to do any of this. I mean, they weren't paying us very much, but we were all being able to make some money. And that just felt like wildly, I don't know, lucky. And then as it grew, I I think I just kept moving the goalpost. Like I always just wanted a place for handmade work. Then handmade work became a part of the vernacular. And then I wanted to write more about people in business and women in business. And so we started doing that. And then I think as that kind of became a focus of the site, I started talking about bigger issues like racism and classism and just, you know, why are some people's houses tiny houses and why are some people's houses, you know, um, trailers? Like, why do we use different terminology for these things? And at that point, it became clear that Design Sponge had become a very different thing. And and to be super honest, it not a thing that was working very well, because I think the vast majority of our readers would prefer that it just stays a place about houses. But as I've gotten older, I can't in good conscience write about a bunch of people, you know, spending four million dollars on a brownstone and not talk about how the families that were there before, you know, lost their houses or maybe, you know, are being gentrified. And so it's kind of in this interesting stage of realizing that as it grows, I need to split this content into different projects. And that's how I started writing books and started a magazine and a podcast because I recognize that this content can't be force fed in a place that, you know, didn't originally start with that goal. Yeah, I can see how Design Sponge would have to evolve along with you and continue to reflect your values. But I can also feel the tension that you might feel when your readers who are just looking for a happy story about a brownstone design are confronted with heavier content that maybe they didn't expect to find or or don't want to be confronted with when they're trying to decompress or something. But then just to go back and forth a little, it's like, do I just want to purvey stuff for people to be mindless about? Or I, I really need to contribute something of meaning to society. So, so you decided to do that through books and podcasts. So you had different formats that you could express yourself. And I'm really interested in how the genesis of In the Company of Women happened for you? Because that's such a powerful book. It's such a fantastic compilation of inspiration and advice from kick-ass women who are doing really meaningful things. Tell us how that got started and and tell us about the whole project of putting that together and getting it off the ground. It was for sure, it's the most meaningful project I've ever done. I think it probably will be for the foreseeable future. It was a very watershed moment for me. A lot of it came from doing my old podcast after the jump and I sort of the feedback I got about it not being inclusive about there not being enough people from a different age range and different backgrounds and different financial backgrounds and realizing that the content I wasn't putting out there myself but that there wasn't a lot of in the mainstream media as well needed to be created and I loved talking about people running businesses. Um, I love talking about entrepreneurial culture and what's wrong with it, what's right with it. And I started collecting business books and just realizing I wasn't connecting to almost any of them and that I wasn't connecting with the people who were like in Forbes or Inc. And I was recognizing like, there's no inclusivity here. And when you talk about businesses, you're defining them in this very narrow way that relates to like venture capital money. And so I wanted to create this like very visual compendium that ultimately would hopefully have more people feel represented and then not only see themselves there as a way to just acknowledge their importance and their existence, but as a way to tell them what was possible. And one of the things that I heard so much about sort of the lack of inclusivity in design was that there's a whole generation of young people. And if they don't see themselves in all of these possibilities, how are we going to ensure that our community 
grows and becomes bigger and includes more different types of people if we aren't showing them that these are possibilities. And so I kind of kept that at my core. And then I focused on other factors just to kind of make sure that we had a wide range of business types and ask them very difficult questions. I didn't want this to be like a highlight reel of all the greatest things they've all done. I wanted to talk about things that were difficult and failure and uncomfortable. And we made the entire book in two months. I think with a deadline like that and energy like that, you either get on board or you're off. And so it was like, we reached out to people and we were like, here's this totally wacko project. It's happening like right now. Can you get on or can you get off? And like everybody for the most part was like, yeah, this is great. And so we kind of went around the country and got to meet some of my biggest heroes and I honestly felt like when the book was turned in, I did not care how it did it after that point. I felt so moved by that experience and what I learned just listening to all of those people that I was like, I hope people read this because there are some incredible people in here and their stories haven't been told yet. But I also just felt like putting this together for me was a very lightning rod moment of like, you're not going to go back to doing business the way you did it before. Like what I've learned from this book and what I've learned that I was doing that wasn't great I I can't go back to that. And so I ended up kind of pulling myself out of Design Sponge more and working more on side projects. And after the book came out and I did the tour for In the Company of Women, that's when I started pitching Good Company and realizing like I wanted to keep these conversations going, but I didn't want to just replicate the book over and over again with volumes, you know, two through four, because at that point, there were already so many books that came out after that that were so similar. I felt like that format's been done. What, what's next. And so I'm always kind of trying to reach out as soon as I finish something to figure out like, where where do we evolve this from here? So you say good company and by good company, you mean both the print magazine and the podcast. Okay, yes. tell us all yes. about good company and what the mission is there and what shape it takes. So good company is still figuring itself out. It's interesting because I, I mean, Design Sponge was started so long ago before, and I never, obviously, I never imagined it as like a business or a brand or anything like that. So this feels like the first time I'm actually starting something on purpose. And it's been a lot bumpier because launching a business right now versus launching it in 2004 is just very different. It's more different than it would have been like five years ago because social media just doesn't work in the same way and getting people to buy something in print is not right. Um, But I really wanted a place to have these deeper, messier conversations. And that's not an always an easy thing to get people to do. But it's something that I feel really strongly about because I feel very alienated by kind of contemporary girl boss culture. And I don't mean girl boss, like in that one particular book, I just mean the culture kind of around it. And I felt like I want to create an alternative where we can talk about things that aren't perfect, that aren't really clean and neat and things that don't work out. And I don't want it to all just be girl power. I want it to be like really honest. And I also wanted to degender it a bit. And so good company, unlike in the company of women, doesn't only focus on women. Like there are cisgendered men, there are trans men, there are non-binary people. I just, I wanted to broaden the conversation and not limit myself too much that way. I love how this whole initiative is at its core, like a new way for you to express yourself through what you learned as a kid with riot girl culture, with counterculture, with DIY, like being scrappy and punk rock and badass. It's just taking all those things you did or learned when you were younger and putting that energy into something new and different, but with those same values. Yeah, I I try to. I mean, I obviously don't succeed at it all the time by any means, but I think that that kind of DIY Riot Girl. And I mean, it's interesting because Rookie Magazine, which I, meant so much to me and so many other people, to me was like the perfect modern version of that culture it was like, make it yourself, you know, literally collage <laughs> it together, like, don't make it too perfect and too neat. That's what I respond to. And it's tough, because these days, I don't think that's what people respond to right now. Like, I think people like polish, and they like perfect, and they like really neatly organized flat lays and like things that are just very Instagrammy. And right now, I crave everything that's the opposite of that. So, you know, every few years, I run up against this issue of what I really love and what I most respond to is not really what the market's responding to right now. So I'm in this weird place of like, I don't want to make something that doesn't feel real to me. But 
I also can't afford to push something that's not working. So I'm always trying to figure out that balance between being honest and true to myself and what feels important and something that's actually sellable because I want to pay the people that work on these projects. That's the only way that I think we're not DIY is that I really feel strongly that people should be paid well for their work. So that's what I'm always trying to do is how can I combine the access and the privilege that I have with you know, work in communities that maybe don't always have access to that same financial support. So I'm interested in talking a little bit about your creative process as it applies to your business. You have a lot of things on your plate now with the magazine and the podcast and the Design Sponge website. And you mentioned another book. So can you tell us kind of how you go from one hat to another? It doesn't happen cleanly. I'll I'll tell you that. There's there's a lot of stressing out. There's a lot of answering people's emails way later than I should. There's a lot of missing things on my schedule. It's different. There will be some years where I multitask like a pro and I feel energized by having so many different things on my plate. And then there are years like this one I've had this year where I just feel like I'm always behind the ball and trying to catch up. And that's not a great feeling. But it's just kind of been how my life has always gone. Like you have up years and you have down years. And this has been one where I realized like, ooh, I had bitten off a lot of things. And that means that one of them is going to suffer. So in 2019, my focus is definitely on how can I sort of prune back some of the projects that I have, or at least how broad they are with the interest of just trying to enjoy them more. I think I've forgotten how to enjoy my work recently. (laughs) I think I've really gotten caught up in like, how successful can this be? How can I pay people more money? Like, how can I be more inclusive? And I think I've just gotten too caught up in the end goal. And I've forgotten to like, enjoy the actual project. So the book that I just pitched is one that I hope I can sell next year, and just spend the year focusing on that, because it's something that's really important to me. And it's about intergenerational connections. And I just want to be in conversation next year and not be in reaction. And this year has been like just one big year of reacting to like always being behind on a deadline. So I think I need to make my creative process a bit more present and a less how many things can I have my hand on at the exact same time. I like that. I think that's a very noble goal. And I want that for myself, too. So I totally relate to it. You get in chapters of your life where you you find yourself just not enjoying the things that are so meaningful to you. And you're like, why? And how can I get this back? And I think presence is, is part of it. I really would like to focus on conversation and not reaction. But when survival's kind of at your door, that it makes it kind of hard to have fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's a reality. And I think it would be one thing if my work was all just me, like in the early days of Design Sponge, I could stop and go whenever I wanted because it was just me. And now like, I have a, a very small but a team of people that depend on me for income and mortgages and health insurance. And that's a really mm-hmm. real thing. And I think a lot of me would have done things very differently for the past few years if it had been me, but I care about the people I work with. And then sometimes I care about them way more than I care about the actual project. And so I think this year has been me kind of trying to figure out, okay, like how do I prune things back in a way that leaves more time for enjoyment of the projects versus growth of the projects? And I think I personally got like I wouldn't call it imposter syndrome, but I definitely got caught up in like the comparison game and feeling like, okay, they're doing this. So I have to do this now, or I, you know, I should grow it this way just because everybody else is. And I don't know, I had a very like aha moment when rookie closed this year where I was like, okay, I need to start focusing on what matters to me and what's really important and why I'm doing them because I'm never making enough money to be doing something that I don't enjoy. And if I'm not enjoying it, I need to figure out how to enjoy it. So this year, I'm really trying to make joy the focus. I like it. I mean, I'm really curious about your journey to finding your authentic voice. You've sort of talked a bit about when you were younger and you were collaging and and found your voice through that. But then journalism school is kind of about having a neutral, non-biased opinion. And then when you started Design Sponge, you were sort of polished and perfect. Your brand is part your personality on top of everything else that you want to talk about. So personally, what were the inner workings like as you got more and more comfortable with your own voice and then sharing your voice 
with the public? It's interesting. In my experience, finding your own voice is not a linear process. I think it's it's almost circular. For me, it's been kind of working up to a place where I care less about the reaction to something and more about needing to express something. But then I know I, I live like that for a little bit and feel comfortable writing that way. And then we'll learn like, ah, okay, well, in my you know desire to write without caring about reaction, maybe I've written in a way that leave some people feeling left out or that's like totally not acknowledge something that's somehow oppressive or exclusive in a way that leaves people not feeling great. And so I kind of learn and then unlearn things every few years. And so I think in terms of my voice, it's always changing. I mean, I think like the person I was a few years ago is very different than the person I am now. So I think that I always try to be honest with who I am right now without presenting myself as an expert in anything other than my own life so far. Um, But that doesn't work business wise, to be honest, like people want you to have like one finished done voice, because that is how you sell something. You are like the expert at this. And you know, all the things and the 15 ways Mm -hmm. to do whatever. And like, I don't have any of those answers. I all I know is what's worked for me and what hasn't worked for me so far. And learning to kind of just let it go and try to own up to the fact that even when I'm really honest and I'm like telling my true story, that could still upset somebody. Like that's been what I've tried to learn this year is that how do you balance being honest and transparent and recognizing that despite your best attempts, you still might leave somebody feeling left out or upset. And that's something I've just tried to wrangle with this year when it comes to like authenticity and voice. That's a tough one. I mean, you can't be all things to all people. That's something that like we're taught in a cliche, but you have to learn it sort of bit by bit. I know I grew up really trying to accommodate everybody, thinking that being likable was awesome, but nobody can re- can really check all the boxes for all the people. And when you try to, you end up being team voice, like you were talking about earlier. You end up being this yeah. like sort of homogenized, pasteurized version of yourself. And that's not really serving anybody either. So Yeah, it's a it's a difficult thing yeah, to Yeah, and I appreciate that you've allowed yourself to evolve and you've not held yourself to like this is what I started with design sponge and I have to keep brand integrity so I can't grow and evolve yeah. because ultimately that would just become your cage, your trap. Yeah, I think brand integrity for me and for Design Sponge just means like recognizing that I'm always going to like stick my foot <laughs> in my mouth, whether or not I, int- I intend to, and being okay with apologizing. Like I filmed a lot of apology <laughs> Instagram stories this year and I feel like that is what people expect from me now. But in a way that's good. Like, I don't think people would come and complain to me as often as they do if they didn't feel like I cared enough to listen. And on, on a good day, that's a really good mm-hmm. feeling. And on a day where you get a lot of feedback, that's a frustrating feeling. But ultimately, I know that I appreciate that people come to tell me why they're mad at me about something that I've said or written, because they will say to me, like, you know, I'm writing you because I think you're going to listen. And That means a lot to me because I I didn't get into this for clicks. I got into this because I wanted to find friends and people to talk to who cared about things that I cared about. And at the end of the day, the vast majority of those conversations where someone's reaching out to me with criticism, whether it's constructive or not, do end up being real conversations and connections. And those sometimes feel few and far between when we're mostly all kind of working on social media these days. So in a way, I'm I'm thankful for them. So my brand is always going to be apologizing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just mentioned screwing up every once in a while and having to apologize for it. But are there other obstacles that you face in work or business that are more creativity stifling? Yeah, I mean, I think that like we were talking about before with this idea of is it content? How do you turn this into content? I think that is the number one thing that kind of kills my creative energy is immediately needing to think about how this could be a set of posts or an Instagram video or whatever. Like there was a point in my life where that fueled me. And I thought like, oh, we're going to go to Brimfield and we're going to do this thing with a team and we'll turn it into like this series of posts and this, you know, how to, and these 10 tip lists and whatever. And now I just feel like, oh, I can't, I can't do it. 
but that's also just kind of a reminder for me that like, yeah, okay, you're not in that phase of work life anymore. Like that doesn't work for me. I need to have people who do feel that way about that type of content. And it's okay if that's not me. I just think my place in all of my projects has to evolve as I get older and as my interests change. So whenever I feel myself falling into that creative trap of like, how do I turn this into content? I try to just go do something in my personal life that has like absolutely nothing to do with work and remember that I am a human being outside of the things that I produce and that what I produce means far less than the real life connections that I have with people. And whenever I can take myself back to that place, the the creative block releases itself. Can you share with us what that place is for you? Like what are some of the things that Grace Bonnie, the human being likes to do when you're not working? It's so funny. I was talking with um, my wife, Julie, about this yesterday and how both of us feel like on the precipice of some sort of like very 180 career change and trying to figure out what that looks like without being reckless, but also understanding that sometimes like change has to be a little unsettling. And we both were talking about how much we enjoy taking care of people and taking care of things. And sort of being of service to others. And we've done a lot of volunteering since we moved out of the city and up to the Hudson Valley where we live now. And that's been really life-changing for both of us. It's also led to two very important friendships we have with women that we volunteer with who are in their 80s and 90s. And being able to spend time with them always puts things in perspective. Like they literally don't understand the work that we do. (laughs) (laughs) And so whenever we spend time with them and they're, you know, both in their later stages of life, like it really is the type of perspective that I need because it's really easy for me to get caught up in, you know, what somebody from Singapore thinks about what I posted yesterday and why they're angry and calling me a hack or something. And then I go and I sit down with these women, Georgine and Diane, and, you know, I hear about their life in the thirties and the Bronx. And like, I'm suddenly reminded that none of that stuff matters. Like, sitting down and talking to people face to face and listening to them and their stories and sharing your story, like, that's way more important. Those are going to be things I carry with me until I'm 90. When I'm 90, I'm not going to remember the angry person from Singapore. So I try to just have more moments where I take myself out of the internet as much as humanly possible. Oh, the internet can be such a (laughs) bubble, can it? (laughs) It can't. I mean, it can be a home for beautiful things too. But yeah, and whenever I feel like, really disgruntled about it, I have to remind myself, like, this is your problem, Grace. This is not the internet's fault. Like, you are spending too much time here. You are prioritizing it too much. Like, get yourself out. And so (laughs) I've become a big fan of, like, the mute button and a big fan of just, like, limiting how much time I spend on social media, which, again, bad business decision, but one that feels good personally. Well, keeping yourself in good shape to run your business is a good business decision. So on some level... You know, all your businesses can't run without (laughs) you. So (laughs) that is very true. So personally, like in your own life, or even in your work, since your work and life is kind of the same, what would you consider to be your bravest act of courage? I think the one that is most public facing, I think would be, I think coming out publicly and kind of uprooting my life six years ago. I felt like I was literally just setting my world on fire and everyone else was just going to watch it burn down while I was in it. And that didn't happen. (laughs) And that was really nice. I'm really glad I made that decision because I think that it changed everything in my life. It, It changed how I saw myself, how I saw my work, how I saw everybody else around me and what my place in that was. And I'm really glad I did that. I had a lot of people tell me not to do that. And I'm just, I'm really glad that I did. And at the time that felt like the scariest thing I had ever done. I think coming up, like I had big career changes, like on on the horizon. And I I feel like something new is about to happen. And I feel like it's time for me to make a change. And I don't know what that is yet. But I think moving toward it is going to be the next bravest thing I do. Because when you build something that's functioning well, and you know, you know how to run it, like it seems crazy to try to think about taking it in a different direction. But I think I'm in that place now where like content creation is just not as interesting to me as it used to be. So I'm trying to kind of work myself up to take a step in a different direction and see what that looks like. But I don't know what that is yet, but I can feel it brewing. Like it just that internal mm. bubbling feeling mm, is happening. You're percolating, girl. You are percolating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
So I'm going to ask you what you think your most meaningful contribution to society is. And you you talked about in the company of women being Mm. the most meaningful thing that you've created through work. Does that stand as the most meaningful contribution or is there something you've done that we don't know about in your volunteer work or something that just really fulfills you and encourages you that to press on and that the world is ultimately benevolent at its core? I don't know what's most meaningful to society. I guess I'd have to ask oh. society. I have no <laughs> idea. Um, I know that I feel the most useful and the most fulfilled in my life when I am of service to other people. And that can happen at work. Like that does happen. And I thought the conversations that I had on the in the Company of Women book tour and on the Good Company tours too, those have felt like being of service in a way and being able to listen to people's stories and their struggles, whether it's starting a business or ending a business. And those have been really meaningful to me. But I don't think anything else really fulfills me in the same way that my volunteer work has, because the internet is so ephemeral and you can't reach out and touch it. And there is something about Like the shift that we do every week is cooking food for 70 people and packing it up and getting it ready. And it's so finite and so defined. And there's a clear start and a clear end and a clear goal. And getting to have projects like that where I can actually mark like what has been done, that I feel so good. I just, I really miss that about the internet. Like you produce something and you put it off into this like nebulous ether. And then you, you know, you might get DMs and emails about it, but it doesn't feel tangible. And so I think right now I'm most fulfilled by things that feel You're able to quantify your accomplishment, your energy that you put out that day. You can measure it in some some way that's a little more concrete. Yeah, and there's like a physicality. I think I miss the physicality of... Yeah, there's much more of a range of motion because you're not just at a keyboard and a mouse. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. I mean, I'm on my way to just having the world's worst (laughs) posture. So I think that... (laughs) <laughs> Some sort of physicality needs to be in my future because this, this like desktop, you know, uh, sitting on my couch lifestyle has, has got to change. At some I know point. when you told me that you like mostly work sitting on your couch with your laptop, I was like, Oh my God, that sounds so uncomfortable. <laughs> it is so comfortable for me, but yeah, I am very I aware that like, as I inch closer to 40, my body is like, no girl, that is not comfortable. <laughs> I'm one of those people that has to sit like at a desk with a big monitor and a keyboard like I'm in an office, even though it's at I my wish house. I was. <laughs> I'm literally sitting at my wife's desk right now. It's just like very long, like maybe this is like a 12 foot, like kind of DIY desk we built. And we're like, we'll have a, you have a side and I'll have a side. And I literally never set up my side and it's been four years and it's just <laughs> empty. And it's a stack of all the inspiration boards I've made every year. And that's all I have at my desk and nothing else. And I only work on the couch and like watch Netflix and work at the same time. Um, <laughs> but that worked, that worked for me. It just feels like it's time for, it's time for something new. If you were to give some advice to creatives about business in the digital social media age, what advice would you give? I would give the advice that I never took, but I wish I had, which was to write down what your goals are before you start. I think that there's this like very romantic notion of like, just jump in and don't look before you leap and like, let it be fun. And that's, that is important. But If you set out with the goal of wanting to build a business, I think that the way the internet is set up right now, it's very easy to lose track of why you started something or why you want it to exist in the world or why you want it to be different because something that's different and especially something that has any sort of like ethical mission at its core, it is really easy to lose that when the rest of the internet gives you this very clear formula of what it would like you to be that would be more popular. So I would say write down a mission statement print it out, put it on your wall and, and stay true to it for as long as that feels right for you. Because I think I've watched a lot of really beautiful businesses kind of become Instagram versions of themselves because that's what's more popular. And I just, I miss kind of different businesses and things that like don't look or sound or feel anything like what's popular. I'm just, I'm missing that kind of edge right now. Yeah, that reminds me, we were talking to Madeline Weinrib um, a couple of episodes ago, and she talked about like getting likes on Instagram, and following the things that are popular rather than following the things that truly, you know, make you happy when you make them. 
Um, and that can easily happen to anybody who goes on social media and tries to build a business. You know, the, the formula is the more likes and engagement you get, you know, that's what people want and that's what you should be doing. But I totally agree with you where you, you end up losing that sense of like why you wanted to do the thing you wanted to do in the first she place. She also made the very salient point that new things are not always liked right away. They take time to yeah. incubate and to marinate with and for people to wrap their heads around them and to come into favor. So not getting likes doesn't mean it's not good. It just means it's new. Exactly. And I think that we've kind of built, not like the three of us, but the internet has built a system that says likes equals good. And that's just not true. And I've, I've also watched some really amazing businesses think that they're not great because they're not getting enough social media support. And it's just, it's sad. I think the times I've been the happiest of Design Sponge was when we were the most different than other sites that existed, where we were weirder or more out there or more driven and just talking about things that were different. And those are usually not the times when we were the most popular or the most successful, but they were the times that I was the happiest because I just, I don't see the benefit in being exactly like everyone else. I just think it's way more fun and way more creative to just do something different and do what feels like you. And everything is cyclical. Like what's popular right now won't be popular next year. And I think especially people like Madeline Weinrib, like who have such a signature style, like that may come and go in terms of like market trends, but it will eventually come back to that. So I think holding true to what makes you, you is always a good business decision. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think with Design Milk, we, we cover a lot of really cool international events in countries that aren't known for design. And I really feel very strongly that that's important because there's a lot of wonderful things coming out of other places that don't get lots of exposure. And so we're there to expose it. And they're definitely not our most popular posts, but they're the ones that I love the most and the ones that are most meaningful to me. And the ones that make me most proud of like having this magazine that you know, not only shows beautiful architecture that gets lots of likes and followers, but also has this other aspect to it where we're, you know, we're trying to share really good and meaningful and quality work with people. So I, I feel that a lot. You talked a little bit about a book, but what is one thing you hope to see happen within the next 12 months besides getting your book deal signed? <laughs> mm, that's a good question. I, I really want to travel more next year. I am a, like the quintessential homebody. And I think when I have to travel for work, I kind of give travel an, un, an unfair bad rap. And so next year, I would like to find ways to travel that are purely for inspiration, that are not for content, that are not for work, and that are about recharging myself as a person and kind of refinding my voice. I think I'm in that rebuilding stage again of like, who am I right now? Like, I was 23 when I started Design Sponge, and I'm 37 now. And I think I just really need to give myself some more time and some more space to figure out like, what I want to do right now. Like, I got to do what I wanted to do for so long. And I think I never thought about like, do you want to do this forever? Like, and if you don't, what does that look like now? And so I want to give myself some space next year to imagine and to dream about different possibilities and to travel and see different places. So I don't know what that will look like in a concrete sense, but I really want to just let myself be creative without any rules next year, because I just, I don't want to turn it into content. That just, that's my motto for next year. It's just don't oh, turn it that into sounds content. delicious. Like gooey dessert with ice cream on top. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> what is one wish that you might ask the universe for in your lifetime? Mm, oh, more dogs. Oh, just dogs lots are the more best. dogs. <laughs> so many. Like I every time I see a dog walker in New York City, I'm like, why am I not doing that? I would be so <laughs> honest, I would be so happy with that job. And I was in New York City today to meet one of our contributors, Christina, who lives in Rome. I get to see like once a year. And on my way back to Grand Central, there was somebody walking through Grand Central with like 17 dogs on different leashes. And I just thought, like, man, that guy has got it figured <laughs> out. So 
<laughs> I think at some point in my life, I would like to just own a herd of dogs. I'm not sure for what purpose, but I think I'd be a very happy person. Do you have a fairly large yard up there that you could have I, more dogs? We do. We have, I mean, for our town, we have like the puniest of plots, but we have like a little less than four acres and we fenced in an acre of that. Oh, and that so is that's where great. Our dogs run around and make a huge mess. Um, so we could fit a lot of dogs in there. How house, many do you I have mean, now? Fitting them. We only have two. I, I think in my head, I could easily have like 15. But that would be insane. So I think two is really good for right now. But at some point in my life, I, I could see myself having some sort of like rescue group or fostering dogs or, or doing something like that. But again, all projects that don't really lead to financial stability. <laughs> yeah. figure out how to marry I have a dream things. of, I, I keep calling it a gluten-free petting zoo because I, I'm allergic, <laughs> but I, I have this fantasy <laughs> of only hypoallergenic animals and all the allergic kids can come and pet anything on the land, like sheeps and gluten-free dogs. And, <laughs> and there's a cafe that that doesn't serve shellfish or peanuts. <laughs> like <laughs> that, I mean, I tell you, like if you put some like Instagrammy wall things in the back of it, you could definitely get that project off the ground. Oh, especially in Southern oh California. Oh my god, wouldn't it be amazing exactly. though if you could go and everybody could bring their hypoallergenic dogs or pets and their sheep, and and all the people who are allergic just don't have to worry about it for a day. They could just pet anything there. <laughs> I think you've got a good idea. Girl. I like it. Got you should, okay, oh, good. Point. Yeah, I like that you've put it out into the universe because maybe the universe will answer okay. you. Good. Thank you, guys. <laughs> so what what projects do you have right now that you'd like our listeners to know about? So since this is our 15th year of Design Sponge, and we recently announced that it will be our final season of Design Sponge, it is sort of going to be a take all of the fireworks we have left in the shed and set them off all at once kind of year. And we have all sorts of fun stuff coming up. Um, We're working on kind of like a mini documentary about the history of Design Sponge to kind of celebrate where we've been and what we've done. And I want the whole rest of 2019 for us and the team to feel like a really fun homecoming and just a celebration of what we've learned and everything we've built together. And then to just see what comes next. I feel like this next chapter has been building for a while. And I think rather than than having it be a sad thing, I just want to celebrate for a whole year. So I think this year we are literally just going to try out a ton of different things that we've always wanted to do. And I'm really excited about it. And I wanted our last year to be fun and not sad. And I think that kind of sense of fun that I had been missing for a while is our literal only goal for 2019 is how do we have a good time? How do we express that on the site? And how do we kind of maybe stop caring a little bit about being this like perfect brand and just have a good time. So I think with that kind of goal for the year, there's going to be a lot of fun stuff. There's going to be some parties. I think some dinner parties are going to happen across the country. I think it's going to be it's going to be a fun 2019. Wow. Wow. Well, congratulations. And I feel like how exciting to look forward to a 2019 that's just like a birthday all year long. <laughs> yeah, I feel like so often like we forget to like celebrate what something has been and what we've all been through together. Like I grew up with Design Sponge. I mean, I grew up, I got married, I got divorced, I came <laughs> out, I got married again. <laughs> like I became like an adult with this project and so many of our readers did and so many of our team members did. I mean, we've seen our team members get married and have babies and move and start businesses and to just celebrate that is something that's really important to me. I I think that we've watched a lot of really amazing publishers and websites and magazines close over the years. And there's always this sense of sadness. And I didn't want that because I'm not sad. I'm really happy. And I'm so proud of what we've done. And so I just wanted to focus on that feeling. And like, I think my whole life is always trying to recreate one of those final scenes from that Jennifer Garner movie, 13 going on 30. Oh my God. You guys seen that? Okay. 
<laughs> there's like the scene where she pitches a magazine at the end of the movie and it's like this very kind of corny tri-fold poster board that she's like printed out all these pictures of like older people and younger people and dogs and sisters and brothers and it's like this big wholesome happy party and when I was thinking about like how do I want to celebrate and finally kind of close this chapter I just kept thinking about that and I was like I want to be celebratory and so I have no idea what that's going to look like this year but we have a lot of things we're going to try and when you don't have to worry about like, well, how, what will this financially cost? And will this let us float for a few more years if we like span this out? But just to be able to be like, screw it. Let's just try it. Let's do it. It's the last year. Let's have a good time. It has completely changed the energy of our whole team. And I'm so happy. About I am that. so excited to see how this all unfolds. Me oh, too. my gosh. And how fun to feel like you can truly experiment again. Yeah, that I missed that. And the second that we made the decision, it was like, in addition to kind of like a huge weight, it just, I f- immediately felt creative again. And that sounds wackadoo, but I really did. I was like, oh, I sat down and wrote an entire book proposal. Like it was the weirdest thing. I, I didn't realize how kind of creatively blocked I was until I decided like to finally officially just try something new. And I think our whole team is in that place now. And that's, that's a really special thing. I think that if you get that opportunity to kind of as a team make a change together and like embrace it, it's it's very special and very meaningful. And to me, that's what Design Sponge has always been. And I feel really lucky to kind of, I don't know, like the send it off into its next chapter with like joy as the focus rather than yeah. like sadness. Yes. I love that. We're cheering you on. <laughs> Thanks, guys. We know we can find you at Design Sponge for a little while longer. Yeah, yeah, for a while. I'm not going anywhere on social media. I'm always there. Okay, that's good to know. So tell our listeners where they can t- keep tabs on everything that's coming down the pike for you. Sure. So for the rest of the year, we'll always be at designsponge.com, um, Design Sponge on all the social media platforms. And those are going to stay up. Like, I have a feeling I'm not going to be on Facebook as much anymore because I really can't, I, can't, I just can't get into it. I've never been able to click with that platform. Ugh. But I love Twitter and I love Instagram. So I'm not going anywhere on those. So I'll always be there at Design Sponge. And then we'll always, at least well, <laughs> the foreseeable future, be at Good Company, which is just Good Company Zine on Instagram. And that's kind of where we keep our business our business inspiration going. This has been an awesome talk. Thank you for, well, all that you do, but also for sharing your story and being so candid with us. I really feel like a lot of people are going to find this so inspiring and so useful and so practical, actually, for their own lives. So thank you. Thank you. Well, that was awesome and exciting and interesting and lots of wisdom. So much wisdom in such a like young package. She's really not that old for as wise as she is. I can't believe she yeah. started Design Sponge when she was 23. Oh, my gosh. I didn't even think about it like that. When I was 23, I was like, I, I was figuring out where I wanted to go back to undergrad. Yeah, it's weird for me to listen to her story because so much of her life kind of parallels mine in so many ways. Yeah, I was going to um, ask not, you about that. Yeah. So like not only being like a white girl growing up in a bubble but also the riot girl, punk rock, like 90s adolescence to the interest in journalism and art to, you know, the starting your own thing (laughs) to growing up on the internet. I mean, all of that. I felt it like it's palpable for me. There was a good chunk of time where Design Sponge and Design Milk and, and maybe Apartment Therapy were like the only major players in the design blog space yeah yeah and what's really interesting too is like a lot of the design blogs at that time you know in the mid 2000s were kind of not very different from one another like Mm -hmm. we were all just kind of talking about stuff Mm -hmm. and then eventually everybody started to branch off and find their own voice and it's been really interesting to watch everybody's individual path and like how their business has grown and how they've changed and just how the person behind the website has developed, you know, as a person and how their tastes have changed. Um, and she talked a little bit about that. And I really am excited for her in everything that she's 
you know, started to do recently with Good Company, the podcast, the magazine, with the book in the company of women. I mean, it's all of that is is she's doing really meaningful and important work. Mm-hmm. And I love that she used her platform for that. Yeah. I mean, if you read her posts and you can tell that she's she's figuring it out as she goes and she's being kind of transparent about that. And that's really refreshing and enjoyable, too. Well, yeah, I mean, she talked about how the Internet, you know, wants you to be picture perfect all the time and not ev- nobody is right. We're all oh, human beings. And she I am. loves having. You should yeah, see me I'm, now. Same. So glad you um, can't see me now. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we do a podcast. <laughs> right. We have a life for radio, <laughs> not for TV. No, but I, I think she likes to have those messy conversations. And I think her being honest and transparent about everything is really important. And it, it, it's part of who she is. She never really wanted to fit into those constructs or those conformities that other people wanted her to be. Like even in the beginning, when she talked about the magazines wanting her to have a team voice, and she was like, no, I want to know, you know, who's doing the styling and who's doing the photography and all of that. I loved that. You know, that's what I think was great about online publications where they they weren't having that voice Um, and they were coming out and saying like, oh, you know, these are the photographer names and the designer names. And it was great to have that sense of transparency. So I have a stupid Internet question and you can tell me because you know how the Internet works a lot better than I do. But all the Instagram influencers that sort of micro blog, they post a picture of them, particularly the fashion ones, they they post a picture of them seemingly going about their daily life, but in a glamorous outfit on a city street, maybe with their baby. And then they write a post that has nothing to do with it. Are they walking around with a photographer? Or are they walking around with a tripod? Like, how are they getting those photos that are not selfies? So there's a number of answers, and the answer is all of the above. Okay. Because some some of them have teams, some of them do it themselves, and some of them have like an Instagram boyfriend or, or Instagram dad. <laughs> right, right. Okay. So I think it all depends on who they are. And also if it's sponsored or not sponsored, because sponsored one, you could have a budget and hire a, photo- a professional photographer and get like a whole photo shoot going. Um, if it's just your own thing, then maybe you do the timer or you have a you know, you have a remote hidden in your hand, or you've got your friend there just trying to make it work. And then you Photoshop the hell out of it. Okay, that makes sense. That's kind of what I thought was going on. But it's nice to have what's really funny about information, you know, they're not actually just walking to the grocery store. They're not really walking somewhere. They've (laughs) literally spent like hours on themselves, figured out exactly what they were going to wear, went to that one specific spot for like 10 minutes, did the photo shoot, and then went back to their computer and checked email and browsed the internet all day and did work. Totally. That's not their life. Their life is literally hustling. My favorite is when you're out and about living your life and you see somebody all styled up with like two people following them around trying to catch like they stop and pose and it's supposed to look candid, but they're being photographed and you're like, oh, that's an that's an influencer at work. Yeah, (laughs) right. It is bizarre. that, you, And you see it more now. Oh, all over the place. Yeah. It's it's definitely funny. I remember in the beginning doing stuff like that. I always thought like I I was a weirdo, you know, and people were going to be staring at me. But then now everybody's doing it. So it's not as big of a deal. But I'm glad I never became like the center of my blog. Mm. Yeah, that was a decision you made on purpose, right? The stress of having to create content and live your life and not be able to distinguish the difference between creating content and just like having your kid's birthday party is like so it's so liberating for me that I like have a life separate from the internet and I don't have to show it and I don't have to think about like you know what I'm going to wear tomorrow and whether or not it's going to be Instagrammable and thank god because nobody wants me to be a fashion blogger (laughs) (laughs) I could be a fashion blogger if it was all about black sweatshirts and black jeans So I really love that she talked about getting back to the enjoyment of what she does. Yes. um, Because what she does every day is intertwined with her life. And so why wouldn't she want it to be enjoyable? Well, and with anything, even if you're doing what you love, not every aspect of it is lovable. And when you start to feel, you know, that it's a business and that other mouths are relying on your business to get fed, you start to feel the pressures of 
survival and economics and and she was talking about content creation and I could see how having a look at everything that you love through the lens of how is this going to be content could start to become drudgery and that's just a natural progression so you have to find ways to figure out how can I love this again I don't have the answers but I love that she's on a on an open quest to figure that out I mean, part of it is keeping the experimental nature alive, but the experimental nature is not conducive to business success necessarily. Yeah. And I think, too, she talked about being liberated and feeling like this next year, there are no more constructs. There's no expectations. It's just let's do the things we want to do because we enjoy doing them or let's do the experimental stuff that we really felt like would be too over the top for people to handle when when we're trying to run this business. And I love that. That's really exciting. And it kind of reminds me of what she talked about when she said she was trying to get back to how she felt when she was younger, when she was creating and making and it and it made her happy. Mm hmm. I know some of my happiest days were in art school, because in art school, my job was to push myself to the outer limits of my creativity. That's what I was there for. And I felt like my job was to grow as much as possible. It didn't matter if my student work sold or it didn't matter if I was building a brand. What I was supposed to do was grow my creativity. And that's the happiest I've ever been, honestly. I think it's kind of like, you know, when you're younger and you're in school or you're just starting work, you know, you're this, you're starting to put up onion layers. Mm hmm. And then as you get older, you start peeling them away to kind of get back at to, you know, what you were, or those wonderful feelings you used to have. And I kind of think that's where she's at in her life and her career. Yeah. It's also, you can liken it to not spending your time or energy or your fucks on things that don't matter as much, but figuring out what matters is its own endeavor. You know what I loved? I loved her relationship with the the women that are in their 80s and 90s. Oh, yeah. I love old people. And I love that they don't understand what the hell she does, and so it doesn't matter, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Because what really matters is they've got this view that includes so many more years to include in their perspective that you can't help but just all the small stuff just recedes. Yeah, I like that she talked about how the internet is like ether, right? Mm -hmm. But these people are, are human beings, and it's tangible. So she can have these conversations with actual people standing in front of her. And then she realizes that like, that's reality. And we can get so caught up in the internet, you know, and yes, some of the things that happen on the internet are absolutely real, and like very important, right? But what we don't want to forget is that there are human beings all around us and there are things that are happening offline and there are things that are more important than just whatever bubble it is that you're in right now on Instagram or on Facebook or whatever. You can tap into the people around you for new perspectives. And sometimes that sh totally shifts the way you look at things. Yeah. I mean, you can write a funny tweet and you can get a lot of retweets and some digital laughs, you know, or some LOLs. But if you make somebody in front of you laugh so hard they choke on their own spit, like that is satisfying in a way that like internet satisfaction really can't be. And Yeah, I agree with that. And it's hard to measure, too. Like, if you tweet something and it gets retweeted, obviously, if it goes viral, that's kind of a big deal. But for the most part, if it just gets, you know, within your average range of retweets, like, that doesn't feel like anything. But always holding someone's hand or helping them across the street or um, sharing a sandwich with somebody always feels like something different and meaningful. Mm hmm. Yeah. You can really feel like the kindness and the humanity. Yeah. Um, plus, I mean, online, um, when people type LOL, do you really think they're laughing out loud? Or do you think they're like, are they like, LOL? You know, like, <laughs> right. are they being sarcastic even? Like, who knows? Like, what's their tone? You don't know, right? Mm -hmm. She talked about a, a more tangible measure of accomplishment. And that's one of the things that I totally relate to. I don't know how to measure the internet success 
But I know when I cut wood and put it together to make furniture that you can sit on or set a table on and use, like that's a real tangible measure of my accomplishment. And it's somehow easier for me to quantify in my head. And so I respect that she's trying to balance herself out and do enough tangible things to work in concert with the ephemera of the internet. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of bloggers out there that have struggled with that. And I've seen a lot of them like write a book or do something like you said, that's more quantifiable, more tangible. But even for us with this podcast, it's like, okay, we put it out there, you know, this is how many downloads we have or whatever. Mm -hmm. But we don't feel it until we walk the aisle of a trade show, like a design show, and people come up to us and say, oh my gosh, it's so weird. It's like you're in my ear, but you're standing right in front of me. Or they come up and they're like, oh my gosh, we listened to you know, the episode with David Weeks, and it was so amazing the way he talked about this and that. And you get into conversations with these people, and you don't know who they are. Like They're just new people you just met, but they know you and there's a connection there. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden that connection is real life and it's tangible and it's in your face. Yeah. Um, and that's how I think we've, at least that's how I measure the success of the podcast, but it still feels like intangible. Yeah. I mean, until those hugs start happening, I've had a few hugs on the ICFF showroom floor where they were like, what? Clever? Oh, my God. I, qu- I quit my dead end corporate job to start this company. And here I am showing at ICFF. And I- and it's like, oh, my God, like really? Best. Clever had a hand in that? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, because I heard all these stories of all these people who were doing it, and it made me feel like I could do it, too. It's the best. <laughs> yeah, it really is. So if you see us, you have to come up to us. Yes. And tell us, you know, your favorite episode or what, you know, what you like about Clever or give us a hug or something. I'm totally down with hugs. And also, we I mean, we'll take feedback. If there's something you want to hear or a way that you think we can make it better, tell us that too. But but sandwich it in compliments. That'll go over a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, everyone. To see images of Grace's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app. Or go to cleverpodcast.com, where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. If you would, please do us a favor and rate and review. It totally helps. We love to chat with you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast. Clever is created, produced, and hosted by us, Amy Devers and Jamie Derringer, also known as 2VDE Media, with editing by Jenny Josephson and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.